on the last episode of Cold Case Hauntings. This is going to be really interesting because it involves an investigative journalist who was found dead in his hotel room in Martinsburg, West Virginia. He said in an interview today that his brother had told him in the last two months that if he died in an accident, don't believe it. God! That? that light just fell over somehow. He said that if the informers Mr. Casalaro had already talked to were to be believed, it involved a conspiracy far worse than Watergate. He had a whole binder, a whole case full of documents and notes. When they found him, all of it was gone. Yeah. What happened? What happened to you, Danny? And we would like for you to come out and talk to us tonight. We're here for you to tell us the truth, Dan. We're here to listen. So it's like it's weird that all of a sudden voices are coming through. Yeah. Make it stop. Make it stop. Please. I said make it stop. Please. Can you tell us where we are, Dan? The F bomb? Don't hurt. A little bit slow, and then some voices started coming through, and then it kind of just stopped. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Dan will have more of an energy tomorrow, more of a, more of a presence tomorrow to come out and speak with us. So, yeah. All right, it is now 2 a.m. and I am getting ready to fall asleep in the same room where Danny Casalaro was found dead in August of 1991. I'm gonna keep this camera right beside me the whole time. If anything happens to me in the middle of the night and I wake up, I'm gonna turn it on and hopefully capture something. But we've got a long day tomorrow, so. Dave is in the room behind me. Dave is in the conjoining room, 215. We're gonna get some sleep and see what happens tomorrow. Good night, everyone. It is the next day here. We are getting ready to start our search for more information on the Danny Casalaro case here. Kind of interesting that uh, it was kind of a quiet night sleeping, nothing really happened, but uh, the more we actually research on our, you know, spare time and our, on our cell phones, the more we find out. And we actually found out that not only was there a professional, national renowned crime scene replicator from Connecticut that was brought in on the case, but after his replication from the, the police information, it came to light that there were some details withheld from him and he went back on his original determination, which was that he said it was not inconsistent with someone taking their own life. Kind of weird. It is very weird. Very strange. A lot of mystery surrounding all of this. Yeah. Strange. Just weird. It is. So we're going to start by heading over to the courthouse. We're going to try. Of course, we're not going to be able to film in the courthouse, but we're going to head over to the courthouse and try and see if we can hopefully find someone who can help us print out documents and records uh, because they keep all that stuff, court documents, police records, that sort of thing in relation to the case. And hopefully we'll be able to get something that we can read through because we've been searching for people to interview. We can't find anybody in this area. No, and it's very weird. Another thing that's happening is, and it might just be a fluke, but anytime we try and search for something, like nothing comes up about anything in this area. Like old locations that uh, Danny went to, they just seem to have disappeared. I don't know. To me, it is very strange. Yeah. Um, it is. We're gonna. We're, I mean, we're desperately trying to find information here, guys, about this case. But there's people in the area that say they heard about it when it happened but nobody was actually here or was connected with it. No. And we can't get a hold of anybody that actually was connected or knew Danny. We've reached out, we've messaged people, 
nobody's responded to us. Nobody got back to us, so. Yeah. Everybody uh, kind of just, I don't know. They seem like they've never heard of it before, or they just kind of clam up and don't want to talk about it, mm-hmm. which is strange. Tonight is going to be the real test to see if we can get answers from him. Yes, it is. Oddly enough, this morning when I woke up and first went to go get a cup of coffee before we even were ready to start filming for the day, uh, I ran into one of the housekeepers who said uh, she was cleaning the fifth floor in the housekeeper. She didn't want to be on camera, but she said that she knows all about the case. She knows what happened in the room and she knows that Danny is still there. So. Yeah, I mean, she was telling you that she has herself had activity in the room there. Yeah, she said that she heard the story. She talks to him when she's cleaning that room. And she even said that there was one day that she was cleaning. Uh, she had a bottle of cleaning solution sitting on the toilet. And while her and her colleague were cleaning, the bottle of cleaning solution flew off of the toilet and onto the floor. So it's not uncommon for employees and staff of that hotel to have experiences. No, no, it is not. But we are pulling into the courthouse here now. We got to figure out where we're going to go. So we'll start filming again as soon as we figure out this and what's happening. And hopefully by the time we come back to you guys, hopefully we have some documents that we can, that we can actually go through and review. So if we don't, we'll be pretty frustrated. <laughs> yes, we will. We went inside the building and we didn't find any documents. We did run into a private investigator who works here in the city of Martinsburg and he agreed to talk to us and he also gave us a bunch of names of people that worked on the case. And we're gonna go try and find and track down some of these people and hopefully we can get an interview or something with someone. Hopefully yes. find someone who's willing to talk to us. So it's kind of a kind of the first big breakthrough we've had on this one. He told us that one of the detectives that worked on the case for Martinsburg Police is now the chief of police. And he even told us that one of the maintenance men that worked on, that worked at the hotel at the time that it happened is still working as a maintenance man at that hotel. Yeah, so. and he, apparently what he was saying is he helped clean up the room afterwards, so. Yeah. They'll just go in and do the exterior and then they'll do reupholstery and paint and wallpaper and carp and things like yeah. that that room was done overnight i'm sure and it should have been a crime scene for months right but it was done overnight literally and my buddy did it and eric he, uh -huh. oh, okay he has to his bosses oh wow that's so that's there's yeah. some mystery in it with him mm -hmm. but just as a tickler that's a great guy to talk to who no one else has ever talked to yeah. Yeah. Because be he neat. was the guy that was told to get in there and get the f in, get the f out. Are you in contact with him? Yeah, he's funny. So, we just pulled in here to the city of Martinsburg Police Department. We're getting ready to call the secretary of the chief of police, which is George Swartwood. Um, we're just going to ask and find out if he will talk to us, see if he'll give us any information about the case, his own personal experience, not official police business, but just his own stories. Let me call this here. Hi, my name is Ryan Zacherl. I was just inside the front lobby there of the of the police department, and I was told that you were the you were the lady that I needed to talk to to make an appointment to speak with the chief of police, George Swartwood. So it's uh, what, what we're basically doing is we're making a video for YouTube just with general information about the Danny Casalaro case from 1991. And we talked to a guy named John Fink who told us that the chief of police was a detective on the case. And it's nothing official. It's just we would, if possible, like to speak with him and maybe get his experiences into the case because I'm not sure if you heard of it. It's a very mysterious, mysterious case. Okay. Yeah, that would be perfect. Yes, that would be perfect. Thank you so much.
Yes, hello, sir. My name is Ryan Zackrell. I am calling because I was looking for some information on the Danny Casalaro case. I was given your information by a man named John Fink who told, uh, told me that you were a detective on the case. We're just looking to make a video uh, about the case in and of itself, um, you know, because it is a pretty interesting case. So we were just hoping to sit down and hopefully speak with you and maybe get your personal experience on what it was like to work a case that was shrouded in so much mystery. If you could, please give me a call back. My number is 304. And I hope you have a fantastic day and I hope to hear from you soon, sir. Bye. Well, there you go. Just left a message on the police chief's voicemail. And now we wait. Let's hope they don't dodge us. Let's hope. After running into a dead end at the Martinsburg Police Department, we drive around thinking about the mystery surrounding this case. One thing that still puzzles me is the role alcoholic beverages could have played in the investigation. During the initial police investigation of the hotel room, after Danny's body had been discovered, a half-empty wine bottle and a broken wine glass were discovered. Underneath Danny's body, in the bathtub, an empty beer can was found with the razor blade investigators believe Danny used to take his own life. So why is it the Berkeley County Medical Examiner found no evidence of alcohol in Danny's body? The County Medical Examiner theorized that if he stopped drinking on Friday afternoon, the alcohol would be mostly cleared from his system by the time of death on Saturday morning. If that's the case, how could you explain the beer can found in the bathtub with him? We know as soon as Danny arrived in Martinsburg on Thursday, he checked into the hotel and immediately went to the Stone Crab Inn to drink. So that's where we'll go to brainstorm where our research could take us next. When we arrive, we receive a text from John about his friend, Eric, the maintenance man. The guy that we met at the courthouse just by happenstance uh, got us an interview with the maintenance man who cleaned up the room after D Danny Casalaro after his death. So we're really interested in hearing this because he would know, he was the one that cleaned it up. He's gonna know where there was evidence, where there was blood. And he's gonna have an inside look into what was missed, what he felt was missed by the police or by the FBI or whoever was investigating it, so. Yeah, we started this day off not knowing, you know, really where we were gonna go with this, and now we're just a few hours into it, and we are going to be, you know, interviewing, you know, like Ryan said, interviewing the guy who cleaned up the room afterwards. It is, and all of these developments happening when we're sitting in the parking lot of an establishment that Danny Casalaro frequented whenever he was here in Martinsburg. It was called the Stone Crab Inn, but now it's called the Mountaineer Pub. Um, of course, it changed owners, business changed, but we're sitting outside of a place that Danny Casalaro actually used to frequent and drink whenever he was here in Martinsburg, and it seems like his investigative spirit into everything that he was investigating maybe coming into play here. Maybe we're getting a little bit of help from the man himself. Maybe, it sure seems like it. That's crazy. Well, we gotta head back to the hotel here. Let's drive back to the hotel. Yeah. And let's talk to this maintenance man. I'm excited for this. This, this is gonna be cool. I know, this is awesome. When we arrive back at the hotel, we meet with both John and Eric but both of them say they don't have the time to sit down on camera, and Eric even alludes to the fact that he's still nervous about having his story captured on video and audio because he doesn't know what type of dangerous people could be involved in a conspiracy like this. But he does tell us his story in a brief 10-minute conversation in the hotel lobby. When he's finished, he goes back to work, and we go back up to the room to ponder over what he just told us. Okay, so come on in, Dave. All right, so we just got back from talking with the maintenance man, and it seems like just like everyone else that we've contacted, they don't want to go on camera. Um, with him, it was a little bit different. He, he was in the middle of a work day. He was getting ready to hang a chandelier. Um, but 
Also, he said he was a little bit apprehensive, still 30 years later, about talking about this because he was unsure who out there would be upset with answers being found. Sure. Yeah. So we, I mean, we really appreciate him sitting down and talking to us and giving us the information, but yet he didn't want to be on camera. He didn't want to be recorded. So, but it, he gave us some interesting information. Just another person along this journey that just didn't feel comfortable talking about it 30 years later, which should say something about, you know. How mysterious it is. How mysterious and how potentially involved and the higher ups that it could be. Yeah. So. You think about what Danny was working on, the octopus, everything that happened with his research, these secret government agencies, these secret drug smuggling spies, you know, the Iran Contra, all the way to the president of the United States and a lot of world leaders in between back yeah. then. That was what his research was on. So it would make anyone nervous. It's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. But it was interesting what he told us because he said that day he got a call on his phone to come up here to 517 and they wouldn't tell him why. It was from the front desk worker and the housekeeper. Yeah, they. I mean, he had asked them what he needed to bring up to fix and they told him to bring his courage. That's right, yeah. So. They said, your, what, what, what do I need to bring? What am I fixing? And they just said, just bring your courage. Mm -hmm. And when he got up here, he said they were standing outside the door and they just looked shocked, terrified. And then he asked them what was wrong and they said that there's blood everywhere in the bathroom. They didn't actually go into the bathroom, but he said there was, they saw blood everywhere, backed right back out. Mm -hmm. um, nobody knew at that point what was going on. He said all the bathroom walls and everything were just covered. Yeah. And uh, handprints, he said handprints all over the wall. Like someone was running their hands along the wall, razor blades on the counter, razor blades on the floor, beer can on the floor, broken. Uh, broken ashtray, broken glass, like there was some sort of a struggle. And he said it himself, he said, like there was a struggle. Mm -hmm. A bloody champagne bottle between the toilet and the, and the tub there. That's right. But it wasn't until he said he creeped around the door and looked through this crack and saw the arm of someone in the bathtub that he left and went out and called the police. Yeah. He said at that point he wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted to be out of here. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just looked right through the, the door jam right there and, and saw that. So that's some good information, but he did confirm. We asked him, we said, was there blood anywhere else in the room? Yeah. And he said, no. Yeah. He said the room was you know, normal. He had his clothes laid out, newspaper laid out on the bed, and uh, just like a normal, normal hotel room setting. He did confirm, the maintenance man did confirm and say, when Dan's brother got here looking for him and he looked at the note, he said that's not his handwriting. Now that we've acquired a copy of the note, we can take a look at it ourselves and compare it to a page of Danny's personal notebook that was acquired from his home office. Looking at both, we notice similarities and discrepancies. The first thing we notice is that Danny seemed to switch between cursive letters and printed letters frequently in his handwriting. Looking at the note found in the hotel room, it does the same, but to start analyzing, we'll look at the cursive writing because it requires flow and rhythm, and these letters will give us the best conclusion based on comparison. After reading both the hotel note and the handwriting comparison, we really only found one duplicate word, and that's the word B. In the hotel note, the word B shows up once. In our handwriting example pulled from his notes in his home office, it shows up twice. Notice how all three cases, the handwriting is almost exactly the same. Next, we look at the letter S on the end of the word ones. It matches very closely with the letter S on the end of the word contents, and again with the S on the end of the word lists. Staying on the same word, look at how the O is written. Over on Danny's confirmed handwriting example, look at the O in over time. It seems to be a very close match. Now the M in my and me 
compared to the M in dynamic and problem, they're very similar. An argument could be made for the neatness of the hotel note compared to the handwriting example, but this could be explained away, as Danny could have deliberately written more neatly and legibly, so others could read it more easily. At the very beginning of the note, the letter T, and in the very first line, the letter P stand out as distinctly different than any other letters written in our handwriting example. But again, he could have deliberately written more neatly and legibly for others to read, which was not a present circumstance in our handwriting example, as he probably scribbled that information on a page for his own reference. In our own personal opinion, we believe that it is very probable that Danny Casalaro wrote this note. One of our key investigation techniques is the Estes method of mm -hmm. spirit box communication, the Estes method. I think an interesting way to go about that would be for you to sit in the bathtub. <laughs> okay. <laughs> with the headphones and spirit box on to see okay. if he'll come through and talk to you. It's come down to the final night here of investigating in room 517 at the former Sheraton. Yes, here we are. We have gotten to explore the places that Danny Casalaro went to, where he was last seen alive. We've met with quite a few people who have given us knowledge behind the scenes. Yes. Uh, a lot of them would not come on camera, <laughs> but there's a lot to know. There is, there's a lot, a lot to, to uncover here. You know, we've, we've gone through a lot trying to find this stuff. And it, it comes down to the idea of was his death self-inflicted or was his death the result of some feud that he created through his research, through his search for answers and knowledge, trying to uncover this secret organization right. that he believed existed. And it seems to be a, uh, a mixed bag on, on how it actually happened. And I think that's partially why the case is so difficult to uncover because on the flip side, if someone did actually kill Danny Casalaro, there's a lot of people that would make sure that that was never discovered. Yeah. If he killed himself, the conspiracies that have surrounded this case have not allowed it to be put to rest. Yeah. And hopefully tonight we can try and do everything that we can to contact him and we can hear from him what actually happened. That's the goal. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole reason that we set out to do this is trying to try and get his side of his story. And uh, a lot of people have a lot of opinions, but we, you know, we want to hear it from him himself if we can. Yeah. And I think to start the night, even though we did an abandonment last night, in the first part of our investigation, I think it's important. It's an important part of our investigative process to actually set up these cameras and see what they capture when the place is completely empty. Yeah. And everyone at home already saw in the first part what happened during that abandonment. Sitting here, filming this second part, we still don't know. We have no idea. Could have been a lot, could have been nothing. And uh, that's just the way it goes. So why not do two? Mm -hmm. He could have spoken to us last night during our investigation through EVPs. We don't know. We heard some voices through the spirit box, mm -hmm. some voices that sounded like they were very distraught. Almost every voice that came through the spirit box on our first investigation sounded like it was distraught. Yeah, very distraught. Yeah, it's, it was strange. But who knows what'll happen tonight? There's only one way to find out. Only one way to find out. Let's set it up and do it. Let's do it. That's Dave. Everything else is rolling, right? Yep. Got my wallet. Got my keys. I got everything. All right, Danny. Please talk to us. Use some of this equipment. We want to know you're here. And we will be back in a few to talk to you, my friend.
all three of the cameras and the audio recorder were set up for almost exactly one hour while Dave and I went to get dinner. Unfortunately, after Dave reviewed all four hours of this abandonment footage, he found that absolutely nothing strange, unusual, or paranormal happened in the time that we were gone. Hopefully after we return, Danny will feel comfortable talking to us. We're back. I'm trying to get in. Close. So if my shoe comes into frame here. Are you, are you? Danny, is that you? What? That's peculiar. Yeah. What? <sighs> I don't know, that's very strange. Danny, are you here? Are you coming out to talk with us tonight? What oh. the hell was that? Dude. That was on that door. Yeah, yeah it was. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It sounds like it's about to open. Open that door. What oh. the hell was that? Dude. That was on that door. Yeah, yeah it was. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It sounds like it's about to open. Open that door! That chair's in front of it, but... Come on, Danny, you can come out and talk to us. Dude, I'm covered in chills. Yeah, me too. Is that the door that someone came through? Did someone come through that door and hurt you, Danny? That was too weird, man. This going off, and then stopping, and then that, like, I don't know. Let me see if I can recreate this. Try the, try the door. was you, I'm sorry. I know you like to put it, they, we, what was that? What'd you hear? Like a clicking sound. I don't know. We were told you'd like to put on a show for people, make people happy and smile. That made me jump, so hopefully you got a good laugh out of that. You want to do an SD session? I'll go in there. Yeah, we have it all set up for you in there. Um, I'll stay out here and ask the questions and you can go in there and lay in the bathtub where they found Danny Casalaro. 
and we have some candles set up. Hopefully he can draw energy from the candles to talk to you. Yeah. All right, folks, let's just be careful of, of the flames. Get me in here. I am old with a bad back, so. Dan? Dan Casalaro? That's interesting. It did not go off one time when I was in the bathroom. Danny, if you're here, can you give us a sign of your presence? Can you show us that you're here? We're here to talk about the octopus. My name's Ryan, that's Dave. We were here last night introducing ourselves to you. This is Martinsburg, West Virginia. This hotel is no longer the Sheraton. There was a word that came through, but I could not understand it. Thank you if you responded. But look, if it was my IR light setting off that music box. Friends? Yes. Yeah, Danny, we're friends. We want... Dave. Yes, my name's Dave. Yeah, yeah, Dave's in the tub. I thought I heard the word suicide. What? Oh, I got chills so bad right now. Far from murder? Far from murder? Danny, what are you talking about? For the past few days of reviewing this Spirit Box audio, this one puzzled me. Dave's hearing must have been on some sort of superhuman level. Because for the last week, I've only heard one word come through. So I applied a denoiser, vocal enhancer, low-pass filter, and various other audio clarity effects to the Spirit Box audio. And suddenly I started to hear two other words embedded within the white noise. They're very faint and barely come through as a whisper. And I can't say with 100% certainty that the words make up the message that Dave heard. But take a listen again and see what you hear. You may need headphones to hear this voice. Far from murder? Far from murder? Did you hurt yourself or did someone else hurt you? Thank you. Can you go in there and tell Dave? Make it or fake it or something like that? Your family is wondering. Your family has been wondering for three decades. I thought I heard the word Steve come through. Steve. Who is Steve? Come on, Danny, You're gonna have to speak a little stronger. Steve. Who is Steve? Five. Five. Danny, I don't, I don't know what to, what to make of that. You're gonna have to be a little bit more clear. What happened to you in that bathtub? There 
That's not me, guys. Look. That's not me. Come on, Danny. Feeling very uncomfortable. Did Ronald Reagan bribe the Iranians to keep the hostages until after his inauguration? Did he do that, Danny? Mr. Casalero, if you're here with us, go in and talk to Dave just like you did. Or if there's someone else, another spirit that knows what happened to Daniel Casalero, please let us know. Go talk to Dave. Danny, on the side of the bathtub, there's candles. Use the flame the heat from the flame, draw energy from that. Or from Dave or I, you can draw energy from us too. Draw the energy to talk to us, to talk to Dave. Thank you. You're welcome. I just felt the bathtub vibrate? That's weird. I don't know, that's so bizarre. Danny, are you in the bathtub with Dave? Ow. That's weird. All the hair standing up on my body. I got a really sharp pain in my wrist right now. On the back side of my wrist, right there. Danny, are you are you making me feel what you felt? <laughs> that hurts. It's okay if you are. It's okay if you are. Ow. It's okay if you are. Ow. Taking the headphones off, it's going silent. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the S box off. Okay. Sit right there. Okay, what was that? I didn't move the camera. No move? I mean, Danny, would you like me to sit in here for a few minutes by myself and talk to you? We decided that Danny may be more confident to talk to us in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So Dave will stay in the room by himself for a little while 
As soon as I leave, I'm going to grab my room key and head down to the lobby to look for coffee and to give Dave and Danny some space to talk. All right, Danny. It's just us. Won't you come out and talk to me? I hear you making that one in there go off now. Can you push it right off of the side of the bathtub? Now you're checking them out, huh? Hey, you Ryan! Maybe Ryan would hear me and come back in and see what you were doing. It's pretty cool. Okay, I just heard a noise in the bathroom and a noise right over here. Where'd you go, Danny? Can you come back out? I won't, I won't have Ryan come in this time. I know you were an answers man, right? Were you an answers man? You you wanted to know the truth and you wanted other people to know the truth about what's going on. Where'd you go? Danny, did they hurt you and then cover it up? If that's what they did, can you make one of these go off? I know that you know how. But your energy seems to be just coming and going. A lot of people say you got too close to the truth. And certain people didn't like that. Did Looney have something to do with it? The man who rented the room next to you? Mr. Looney had rented the room next to Danny and even had drinks with him the night of his arrival to Martinsburg. They shared a conversation about Casalaro's book and Looney said he wasn't too impressed with his theories. When he was questioned by police, he told them that he played the devil's advocate to Casalaro's research for most of their time together at the Sheraton. That same night, one of Danny's sources turned out to be fruitless. And on Friday afternoon, Casalaro told a bartender that he had had a rough night. If Mr. Looney's criticism contributed to a bad night, it may be a name he remembers. And 45 seconds after Dave asked Danny about the man he had spent most of that Thursday evening with, this happened. So did Looney have something to do with it?
Danny, help me out here. If Looney had something to do with it, can you make this one go off? Anything? Yes. Really? Yes. Yes. Look. Dude, look, it jumped up to a 10.4. Oh, wow. When that mail meter went off in the bathtub, it jumped up to a 10.4 milligauss. That's crazy. That's a high EMF spike. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right at the same time the REM was triggered. Yeah. That means something touched that device. Yeah. Something with something that is made of electromagnetic energy touched that device, causing it to go off because the REM triggered and the EMF spiked up from a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 where it had stayed for over an hour to a 10.4. <sighs> if that's not proof that there was something there that touched that, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's, that's pretty wild. That's crazy. So, I'm over here in 515. Dave just finished his solo with some interesting results and I am going to go in there by myself now and see if Dan is still there and will continue to talk to us. We would have continued, but all of our memory cards were full. So we had to come over here and switch them out. Now I, I have two cameras set up in there waiting on me. I'm gonna go in there and try and see if I can talk to him. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Here, why don't you, uh, why don't you lock me out so people know I'm not coming in and messing with anything. Yep. There you go. All right, Danny. So, Dave stayed in here with you for a little bit by himself and you were talking to him a little bit there. I'm gonna come in here, try and talk to you a little bit myself as well. All right, there's a box in my hand here. I don't know if you remember this, but we were using it last night. Someone in here with me? Three. Three? Three what? coming through so frequently. There's no way. Dan? Dan Casalaro, is that you? That was me. 
I was so focused on debunking the mail meter triggering, which I did cause by touching the bed too hard, that I didn't even hear this voice. But I wish I had heard it in the moment, because when reviewing the footage, I about dropped my coffee. I distinctly hear a man say, hey, and then my last name, as if someone's calling out to me. Hey, Zachary. See if you hear the same thing. We know we've been in here asking you a lot of questions, asking a lot of you to communicate with us. I'm sure it's not easy to do that, so we thank you for that. But we just wanted to have one more conversation with you, if that's okay. You know, we didn't know it, but at separate times while Ryan and I were in here by ourselves, we both got a very sad and somber feeling sitting in here. Did you feel like that when you were in here? We'll have to wake up in the morning and start our long journey home, so. Yes, we do. We, uh, we, uh, have a lot of interest in this case and, uh, can't wait to get back and review everything that we've gone through tonight. Hopefully there's some answers and, uh, if we, did, if we didn't get any answers this time, that doesn't mean that we won't come back and try it again. And, uh until we do get something because that's what we do. It's why we do it, so. Yeah. There's no doubt that this has been one of our most challenging cases. This journey into the life and death of Danny Casalero has been almost all consuming. And for these two days and the weeks that followed, we searched for answers in a way that left us exhausted, confused, and no closer to a definite answer to the question what happened to Danny Casalero. Through our research and our time in this hotel room, we feel like we got to know Danny a little bit. We discovered a passionate, driven, and kind-hearted man who was desperate to leave his mark on this world. Until the day that answers can be found and the truth comes out, we all can honor Danny by remembering him for who he was rather than how he died. At his funeral service, family and friends celebrated Danny Casalaro's life with a song that he wrote himself. It's called, I Adore You Today. Don't worry about those bills. We'll climb a thousand hills. I'm a millionaire. Don't have a dime or care because I adore you today. Rest in peace, Danny.